Wow, look at all the people. Welcome, everybody. I believe we're going to get going here in just a couple minutes. Gatlin, I haven't seen you in a long time. So. Little Beaver. Colorado Glasswing, excellent name. Oh. Oh, so we got, oh, hi, Laura. And Brayla. Hi. Um, you all should be able to hear me. If you can't hear me, raise your hand. I didn't think uh, far enough ahead to put a uh, text chat repeater in. So if you're outside of 20 meters from me, I or each other, you can't see a text chat, but um, so forgive me if you type something in text, I don't see you, um, but feel free to type in text to each other or to me if you want, I'll try to pay attention. But as Miss Goshari asked, please keep mics and such off. Um, and these guys done a fabulous job. I'm just showing up and, and talking. Um, Goshari and Kim and Mike have um, put this whole uh, awesomeness together. Thank you, guys. I hope you're having a splendid build up to Christmas season. Woo! <sighs> Hard to believe we're getting that close, huh? Oh my gosh, look at the time. Well, with Kushari's blessing. Well, it's not. It's 12.59. We can't start yet. We still have another minute yet. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, um, I'm perched over here in the corner. I'm Charles Dickens, reading to you. Um, you can see the big stage. Uh, this You'll figure it all out once we get started. Um, the curtain will have um, lots of cool stuff going on as a uh, backdrop to the to the story as we move along. So um, if you can, have your cameras on uh, maybe a little bit wide focus so you can see everything that's going on. And again, I welcome your text, local text chat in, uh, in local text. <laughs> I think it's kind of neat. I, I'm, I really enjoy people um, participating with each other or um, with the storyteller. Uh, while things are going on, let's me know that you're enjoying it and stuff. Um, no obligation to do so, certainly. But if you want to, please feel free, free, to, free to do so. It's it's not rude. If you start talking to the mic, I'd call that rude. But um, <laughs> text chat, not rude. It's kind of it's kind of fun. It gives me a chance to know what's uh, what you guys are thinking and that you're there and enjoying it. So, <clears throat> with y'all's blessing, Kushari and Kim and Mike, I guess we'll go ahead and get started, huh? As soon as I click one more button, boy, oh, it was always, always one more button to click. Okay, here we go. So give us about five minutes and we'll get everybody settled and we'll be ready to go, huh? Christmas 
Well, okay then. Wow, look at everybody. Anybody I didn't say hi to already? Um, hi, sorry about that. Crash is here. Hi, Crash. And allies and fairy came and little beaver. Graham, I haven't seen Graham in flight forever either. This is awesome, y'all. Desmond, Jenny, Cooper. Hey, nice avatar, Cooper. I got to talk to your designer. Oh, I did talk to your designer. And Dot and C Pearl. Wow. Anybody I missed? Sorry. Hello. Welcome. Woohoo. Merry uh, month of Christmas. I know I should say Merry Christmas, but I always feel like I'm rushing it when I say that, even though we're, you know, we're getting kind of close. Um, <clears throat> again, please uh, remember to have your voice off, which I'm sure you do. Um, set to midnight is probably going to be the best view. Um, Mike and Kim and Koshari put a uh, built some kind of amazing stuff here. So if, if you have the ability, um, advanced lighting model, ALM, and midnight would be the best view. Um, I'm sitting over in the corner. You can probably see me. Um, talking to the guy. I'm the, I'm the guy with the top hat. And there's a big curtain. Uh, a lot of action will be going on behind the curtain. And for those that might arrive in the last few minutes, please feel free to um, chat in, in text if uh, there's no objections or anyone. I like to watch that going on. Um, but not in local voice, por favor. <clears throat> That's um, old Victorian, por favor. So, and away we go. Hello, GM. Thank you. I weren't sure if you were a bot or not, so I didn't say hello to you. Sorry about that. So good afternoon and welcome to Coopersville Christmas Celebration. I am Charles Dickens and I am honored to be a guest here tonight. We have, of course, just entered this exciting new 20, 20th century. <laughs> How strange it feels to, on my tongue to say that. Anyway, in the mid-decades of the past century, with great inspiration, I, I penned the novel that I hope many of you are familiar with, A Christmas Carol. A tale of Ebenezer Scrooge, a, a miser, a warped, frustrated old man. In the next 70 minutes, I will share with you this story of redemption and rescue. Scrooge must face his past, look honestly at his present, and ponder the future of a life unchanged. It is a lesson that calls to each of us this blessed season. A heartfelt thank you to Coopersville for welcoming me here today to share this festive celebration as I, in turn, welcome you to attend to this story we now present. A Christmas Carol in Prose being a ghost story of Christmas. Marley was dead to begin with. <laughs> There's no doubt whatever about that. The register of his burial was signed by the clergyman, the clerk, the undertaker, the chief mourner. Scrooge signed it, and Scrooge's name was good upon change for anything he chose to put his hand to. Old Marley was dead as a doornail. Scrooge knew he was dead? Of course he did. How could it be otherwise? Scrooge and he were partners for I don't know how many years. Scrooge was his sole executor, his sole administrator, his sole assign, his sole residuary legatee, his sole friend and his sole mourner. Scrooge never painted out old Marley's name, however. There it yet stood year afterwards, above the warehouse door, Scrooge and Marley. The firm was known as Scrooge and Marley. 
sometimes people new to the business called Scrooge Scrooge and sometimes Marley. He answered her both names. It was all the same to him. Oh, but he was a tight-fisted hand at the grindstone with Scrooge, a squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner. External heat and cold had little influence on him. No warmth could warm, no cold could chill. No wind that blew was bitterer than he. No falling snow was more intent upon its purpose. No pelting rain less l open to entreaty. Foul weather didn't know where to have him. The heaviest rain and snow and hail and sleet could boast of the advantage over him in only one respect. They often came down handsomely. And Scrooge never did. Nobody ever stopped him in the street to say with gladsome looks, My dear Scrooge, how are you? When will you come to see me? No beggars implored him to bestow a trifle. No children asked him what it was o'clock. No man or woman ever once in all his life inquired the way to such and such a place of Scrooge. Even the blind men's dogs appeared to know him. When they saw him coming on, would tug their owners into doorways and up courts. They would wag their tails as though they said, No eye at all is better than an evil eye, dark master. Ah, what did Scrooge care? It was the very thing he liked. To edge his way along the crowded paths of life warning all human sympathy to keep its distance, was what the knowing ones call nuts to Scrooge. <coughs> Once upon a time of all the good days in the year, upon a Christmas Eve, old Scrooge sat busy in his counting house. It was cold, bleak, biting, foggy weather, and the city clocks had only just gone three. But it was dark, already. The door of Scrooge's counting house was open that he might keep his eye upon his clerk who in a dismal little cell beyond a sort of tank was copying letters. Scrooge had a very small fire but the clerk's fire was so much very smaller that it looked like one coal but he couldn't replenish it for Scrooge kept the coal box in his own room and so surely as the clerk came in with the shovel the master predicted that it would be necessary for them to part. Wherefore the clerk put upon his white comforter and tried to warm himself with the candle which effort, not being a man of strong imagination, he quite failed. A Merry Christmas, Uncle! God save you! cried a cheerful voice. It was the voice of Scrooge's nephew, who came upon him so quickly that this was the first intimation Scrooge had of his approach. <coughs> bah! Humbug! said Scrooge. Christmas a humbug, Uncle! You don't mean that, I'm sure. <coughs> I do. Out upon a merry Christmas. What, what's a Christmas time to you but a time for paying bills without money? A uh, time for finding yourself a year older, not an hour richer. Mm, a time for balancing your books and having every item in them through a round dozen of months presented dead against you. <laughs> if I had my will, every idiot who goes about with merry Christmas on his lips <laughs> should be boiled with his own pudding <laughs> and buried with a stake of holly through his heart. <laughs> oh, he should. Uncle. Nephew, keep Christmas in your own way. Let me keep it in mine. Keep it, but you don't keep it. Let me leave it alone, then. Much good may it do you, much good has it ever done you. There are many things from which I might have derived good, by which I have not profited, I dare say, Christmas among the rest. But I am sure I have always thought of Christmas time when it has come round, apart from the veneration due its sacred origin, if anything belonging to it could be apart from that. As a good time, a kind, forgiving, charitable, pleasant time. The only time I know of in the long calendar of the year when men and women seem by one consent to open their shut-up hearts freely and to, to think of people below them as if they were, really were fellow travelers to the grave and not another race of creatures bound on other journeys. And therefore, Uncle, though it has never put a scrap of gold or silver in my pocket, I believe that it has done me good and will do me good, and I say God bless it. The clerk in the tank involuntarily applauded. Let me hear another sound from you, said Scrooge. You'll keep your Christmas by losing your situation. You're quite a powerful speaker, sir, he added, turning to his nephew. I wonder you don't go into Parliament. Oh, don't be angry, Uncle. Come, dine with us tomorrow. <laughs> Ma, I'll see you in hell first. But why, said Scrooge's nephew, why? Ma, why did you get married? Because I fell in love. Ha! Because you fell in love, growled Scrooge, as if that were the only thing in the world more ridiculous than a Merry Christmas. Yeah. Good afternoon. Nay, Uncle, but you never came to see me before that happened. Why give it as a reason for not coming now? Good afternoon. 
I want nothing from you. I ask nothing of you. Why can we not be friends? Good afternoon. I am sorry with all my heart to find you so resolute. We have never had any quarrel to which I have been a party, but I, I have made the trial in homage to Christmas, and I'll keep my Christmas humor to the last. So a Merry Christmas, Uncle. Good afternoon. And a Happy New Year. Good afternoon. His nephew left the room without an angry word, notwithstanding. The clerk, in letting Scrooge's nephew out, had let two other people in. They were portly gentlemen, pleasant to behold, and now stood with their hats off in Scrooge's office. They had books and papers in their hands and bowed to him. Scrooge and Marley's, I presume, said one of the gentlemen. You do indeed, sir, replied Scrooge. You don't know us, sir. Nor do I wish to. Um, have I the pleasure of addressing Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley? Mr. Marley has been dead these seven years. He died seven years ago this very night. Uh, at this festive season of the year, Mr. Scrooge, then, said the gentleman, taking up a pen. It is more than usually desirable that we should make some slight provision for the poor and the destitute, who suffer greatly at the present time. Many thousands are in want of common necessaries, and hundreds of thousands are in want of common comfort, sir. Are there no workhouses, no prisons? Oh, plenty of prisons, sir, but on the impression that they scarcely furnish Christian cheer of mind or body to the unoffending multitude. A few of us are endeavoring to raise a, a fund to buy the poor some meat and drink and means of warmth. We choose this time because it is a time of all others when want is keenly felt and abundance rejoices. <clears throat> what shall I put you down for, sir? Nothing. Oh, you wish to remain anonymous? I wish to be left alone. Since you ask me what I wish, gentlemen, that is my answer. I don't make merry myself at Christmas. I cannot afford to make idle people merry. My taxes help to support the prisons and the workhouses. They cost enough, and those who are badly off must go there. Many can't go there, sir. Many would rather die. If they would rather die, they had better do it and decrease the surplus population. At the length of the hour of shutting up the county house arrived. An ill will Scrooge, dismounting from his stool, tacitly admitted the fact to the expectant clerk in the tank, who instantly snuffed his candle out and put on his hat. You want all day tomorrow, I suppose? If quite convenient, sir. It is not convenient, and it's not fair. If I was to stop half a crown for it, you'd think yourself mightily ill-used, I'll be bound. I, I, yes, sir. And yet you don't think me ill-used when I pay a day's wages for no work? It's only once a year, sir. Bruh! A poor excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December. <sighs> but I suppose you must have the whole day. Be here all the earlier next morning. The clerk promised that he would be, and Scrooge walked out with a growl. The office was closed in a twinkling, and the clerk, with the long ends of his white comforter dangling below his waist, for he boasted no greatcoat, went down a slide at the end of a lane of boys twenty times in honor of its being Christmas Eve, and then ran home as hard as he could pelt to play at blind man's buff. Scrooge took his melancholy dinner in his usual melancholy tavern, and having read all the newspapers and beguiled the rest of the evening with his banker's book, went home to bed. Scrooge lived in chambers which had once belonged to his deceased partner. They were a gloomy suite of rooms and a lowering pile of buildings up a yard. The building was old enough now, and dreary enough, for nobody lived in it but Scrooge and the other rooms being all let out as offices. Now it is a fact that there was nothing at all particular about the knocker on the door of his house, except that it was very large. Also that Scrooge had seen it night and morning during his whole residence in that place. Also that Scrooge had as little of what is called fancy about them as any man in the city of London. And yet Scrooge, having his key in the lock of that door, saw in that knocker without its undergoing any intermediate process of change, no longer a door-knocker, but Marley's face. Marley's face, with a dismal light about it like a bad lobster in a dark cellar. It was not angry or ferocious, but it looked at Scrooge as Marley used to look, with ghostly spectacles turned up upon its ghostly forehead. As Scrooge looked fixedly at this phenomenon, it was a knocker again. He said, Poo, poo, poo and closed the door with a bang. That sound resounded through the house like thunder. 
Every room above and every cask in the wine merchant's cellars below appeared to have a separate peal of echoes of its own. Scrooge was not a man to be frightened by echoes. He fastened the door and walked across the hall and up the stairs, slowly, too, trimming his candle as he went. Up Scrooge went, not caring a button for its being very dark. <laughs> yeah, darkness is cheap. And Scrooge liked it. But before he shut his heavy door, he walked through his rooms to see that all was right. He had just enough recollection of the face and the knocker to desire to do that. Sitting room, bedroom, lumber room, all as they should be. Nobody under the table, nobody under the sofa, a small fire in the grate, spoon and basin ready, and the little saucepan of gruel upon the hob. Nobody under the bed, nobody in the closet, nobody in his dressing gown, which was hanging up in a suspicious attitude against the wall. Old fire guard, old shoes, two fish baskets, washing stand on three legs, and a poker. Quite satisfied, Scrooge closed his door, locked himself in, double locked himself in, which was not his usual custom. And thus secured against surprise, he took off his cravat, put on his dressing gown and slippers and his nightcap, and sat down before the very low fire to take his gruel. As he threw his head back in his chair, his glance happened to rest upon an old disused bell that hung in the room and communicated for some purpose, now forgotten, with a chamber in the highest door story of the building, in, double it was with great astonishment with a strange inexplicable dread that as he looked he saw this bell begin to swing. Soon it rang out loudly, and so did every other bell in the house. This was succeeded by a clanking noise, deep down below, as if some person were dragging a heavy chain over the cask in the wine merchant's cellar. Then he heard the noise much louder on the floors below, and then coming up the stairs, then coming straight towards his door. It came on through the divvy door, and a specter passed into the room before his eyes, and upon its coming in the dying flame, as though he leapt up as though it cried out loud, I know him! Marley's ghost! The same face, the very same. Marley in his pigtail, usual waistcoat, tights and boots. His body was transparent, so that Scrooge, observing him and looking through his waistcoat, could see the two buttons on his coat behind. Now Scrooge had often heard it said that Marley had no heart, but he had never believed it until now. No, nor did he believe it even now. Though he looked through the phantom through and through and saw it standing before him, though he felt the chilling influence of his death-cold eyes and noticed the very texture of the folded kerchief round about his head and chin, he was still incredulous. How now, said Scrooge, caustic and cold as ever, what do you want of me? Much. Marley's voice, no doubt about it. Who are you? Ask me who I was. Who were you, then? In life I was your partner, Jacob Marley. Can, can you sit down? I can. Do it, then. Scrooge asked the question, because he didn't know whether a ghost so transparent might find himself in a condition to take a chair, and felt that in the event of its being impossible, it might involve the necessity of an embarrassing explanation. But the ghost sat down on the opposite of the fireplace, as he were quite used to it. You don't believe in me. I don't. What evidence would you have of my reality beyond that of your senses? Uh, I don't know. Why do you doubt your senses, then? Mm, because a little thing affects them. A slight disorder of the stomach makes them cheat. You might be an undigested bit of beef, a blot of mustard, a, a crumb of cheese, a fragment of underdone potato. Ah, there's more of gravy than of grave about you, whatever you are. Mercy, dreadful apparition, why do you trouble me? Why do spirits walk the earth, and why do they come to me? It is required of every man that the spirit within him should walk abroad among his fellow men and travel far and wide. And if that spirit goes not forth in life, it is condemned to do so after death. I cannot tell you all I would. A very little more is permitted to me. I cannot rest, I cannot stay, I cannot linger anywhere. My spirit never walked out beyond the counting house. Mark me, in life my spirit never roved beyond, beyond the narrow limits of our money-changing hole. My weary journey lies before me. Seven years dead, and traveling all the time, and 
you, you travel fast? On the wings of the wind. You, you, you might have got over a quite a quantity of ground in seven years, Jacob. O oh, blind, blind man, not to know what the ages of incessant labor by immortal creatures for this earth must pass into eternity before the good of which it is susceptible is all developed. Not to know that any Christian spirit working kindly in its little sphere, whatever it may be, will find its mortal life too short for its vast means of usefulness. Not to know that no space of regret can make amends for one's opportunities misused. Yet I was like this man. I once was like this man. But you were always a good man of business, Jacob, faltered Scrooge, who now began to apply this to himself. Business! cried the ghost, wringing its hands again. Mankind was my business. The common welfare was my business. Charity, mercy, forbearance, benevolence were all my business. The dealings of my trade were but a drop of water in the comprehensive ocean of my business. Scrooge was very much dismayed to hear the spectre going on at this rate and began to quake exceedingly. Hear me, my time is nearly gone. I will, Jacob, but don't be hard upon me. Don't be flowery, pray. I am here tonight to warn you that you have yet a chance of hope, of escaping my fate, a chance and hope of my procuring, Ebenezer. You are always a good friend to me, thank you. You will be haunted by three spirits. It's not the chance and hope you mentioned, Jacob. I, <laughs> I think I'd rather not. Without their visit, you cannot hope to shun the path I tread. Expect the first tomorrow night, when the bell tolls one. Expect the second on the next night at the same hour, third upon the next night, and the last stroke of twelve has ceased to vibrate. Look to see me no more, Ebenezer, and look that for your own sake you remember what has passed between us this night. It walked backward from him. And every step it took, the window raised itself a little, so that when the apparition reached it, it was wide open. Scrooge closed the window and examined the door by which the ghost had entered. It was double-locked, as he had locked it with his own hands, and the bolts were undisturbed. Scrooge tried to say, humbug, but stopped at the first syllable. And being from the emotion he had undergone, or the fatigues of the day, or his glimpse of the invisible world, or the dull conversation of the ghost, or the lateness of the hour... Much in need of repose, Scrooge went straight to bed without undressing and fell asleep on the instant. Stave two, the first of the three spirits. When Scrooge awoke, it was so dark that looking out of bed, he could scarcely distinguish the transparent window from the opaque walls of his chamber until suddenly the church clock told a deep, dull, Hollow, melancholy one. Light flashed up in the room upon the instant, and the curtains of his bed were drawn aside by a strange figure. Like a child, yet not so like a child as like an old man, viewed through some supernatural medium which gave him the appearance of having receded from the view and being diminished to a child's proportions. Its hair which hung about its neck and down his back was white as if with age, and yet the face had not a wrinkle upon it, and the tender as a bloom was in the skin. It held a branch of fresh green holly in its hand, and a singular contradiction of the winter, wintry emblem had its dress trimmed with summer flowers. But the strangest thing about it was that from the crown of its head there sprung a bright, clear jet of light by which all this was visible, and which was doubtless the occasion of its using in its duller moments a great extinguisher cap for which it now held under its arm. Uh, are you the spirit, sir, whose coming was foretold to me? I am. Who and what are you? I am the ghost of Christmas past. Wrong past? No, your past. The things that you will see with me are mere shadows of the things that have been. They will have no consciousness of us. Scrooge then made bold inquiry of what business brought him there. Your welfare. Rise and walk with me. Now it would have been in vain for Scrooge to plead that the weather and the hour were not adapted to pedestrian purposes, that bed was warm and the thermometer a long way below freezing, that he was clad in but lightly in his slippers, dressing gown and nightcap, and that he had a cold upon him at that time. The grasp, though gentle as a woman's hand, was not to be resisted. He rose, 
but finding that the spirit made towards the window, clasped its robe in supplication. I am mortal and liable to fall. Bear but a touch of my hand. There, said the spirit, laying it upon his heart, and you shall be upheld in more than this. As the words were spoken, they passed through the wall and stood in the busy thoroughfares of a city. It was made plain enough by the dressing of the shops there, too, that it was Christmas time. The ghost stopped at a certain warehouse door and asked Scrooge if he knew it. <laughs> know it? I was apprenticed here. They went in. At sight of an old gentleman in a Welsh wig, sitting behind such a high desk that if it had been two inches taller, he must have knocked his head against the ceiling, Scrooge cried in great excitement, Why, it's old Fezziwig! Bless his heart, it's Fezziwig, alive again! Old Fezziwig laid down his pen and looked up at the clock, which pointed to the hour of seven. He rubbed his hands, adjusted his capacious waistcoat, laughed all over himself from his shoes to his organ of benevolence, and called out in a comfortable, oily, rich, fat, jovial voice, Yo-ho! There! Ebenezer! Dick! A living and moving picture of Scrooge's former self, a young man came briskly, and accompanied by his fellow apprentice. Dick Wilkins, to be sure! said Scrooge to the goat. <laughs> My old fellow apprentice, bless me, yes, there he is. Uh, he was very much attached to me, was Dick. Ah, uh, poor Dick, dear, dear. Yo ho, my boys, my boys, said Fizzywig. No more work tonight. Christmas Eve. Oh, Christmas Ebenezer. Let's have the shutters up before a man can say Jack Robinson. Clear away, my lads, clear away. We have lots of room here. Clear away. There was nothing they would not have cleared away or could not have cleared away with old Fezziwig looking on. It was done in a minute. Every movable was packed off as if it were dismissed from public life forevermore. The floor was swept and watered. The lamps were trimmed. Fuel was heaped upon the fire. The warehouse was as snug and warm and dry, as bright a ballroom as you would desire to see upon a winter's night. In came a fiddler with a music book, went up to the lofty desk and made an orchestra of it, and turned like <laughs> tuned like fifty stomach aches. In came Mrs. Fezziwig, one vast substantial smile. In came the three Miss Fezziwigs, beaming and lovable. In came the six young followers whose hearts they broke. In came all the young men and women employed in the business. In came the housemaid with her cousin, the baker. In came the cook with her brother's particular friend, the milkman. In they all came, one after another, some shyly, some boldly, some gracefully, some awkwardly, some pushing, some pulling. In they all came, anyhow and everyhow. And away they all went, twenty couple at once. Hands half round and back again the other way, down the middle and up again, round and round in various stages of affectionate grouping. Old top couple always turning up in the wrong place. New top couple starting off again as soon as they got there. Old top couples at last, and not a bottom one to help them. When this result was brought about, old Fezziwig, clapping his hands to stop the dance, cried out, Well done! Well done! And the fiddler plunged his hot face into a pot of porter, especially provided for that purpose. Oh, there were more dances, there were more forfeits, and more dances, and there was cake, and there was negus, and there was a great piece of cold roast, and there was a great piece of cold boiled, and there were mince pies, and plenty of beer. But the great effect of the evening came after the roast and boiled, when the fiddler struck up Sir Roger de Coverley. And then old Fezziwig stood out to dance with Mrs. Fezziwig. Pop couple, too, with a good stiff piece of work cut out for them. Three or four and twenty pair of partners, people who were not to be trifled with, people who would dance and had no notion of walking. But if they had been twice as many, four times, old Fezziwig would have been a match for them, and so would Mrs. Fezziwig. As to her, she was worthy to be his partner in every sense of the term. A positive light appeared to issue from Fe Fezziwig's calves. They showed in every part of the dance. You could not have predicted at any given time what would become of them next. When old Fezziwig and Mrs. Fezziwig had gone through all the dance, advance and retire, turn your partner, bow and curtsy, corkscrew, thread the needle, and back again to your place, old Fezziwig cut. He cut so deftly that he appeared to wink with his legs. And when the clock struck eleven, this domestic ball broke up, and Mr. and Mrs. Fezziwig took their stations, one on either side of the door, and shaking hands with every person individually as he or she went out, wished him or her a very Merry Christmas when everybody had retired but the two apprentices, they did the same to them, and thus the cheerful voices died away, and the lads were left to their beds, which were under a counter in the back shop. A small matter, said the ghost, to make these silly folks so full of gratitude. He has bent but a few pounds of your mortal money, three or four, perhaps. Is that so much as he deserves this praise? What? It isn't that, 
said Scrooge, heated by the remark and speaking unconsciously like his former, not his latter self. It isn't that spirit. He has the power to render us happy or unhappy, to, 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 to make us of his light a burdensome, a, a pleasure or a toil. Say, say that his power lies in words and looks and things so slight and insignificant that it, it's impossible to add and count them up. What then? The happiness he gives us is quite as great as if it did cost a fortune. He felt the spirit's glance and stopped. What is the matter? No, uh, nothing particular. Something, I think. No, no. I should like to be able to say a word or two to my clerk just now, that's all. My time grows short, observed the spirit. Quick! Now this was not addressed to Scrooge, or to anyone he could see. But it produced an immediate effect, for again he saw himself. He was older now a man in the prime of his life. He was not alone, but sat by the side of a fair young girl in a black dress, in whose eyes there were tears. <clears throat> Though it matters little, she said softly to Scrooge's former self, to you very little, another idol has displaced me, and if it can comfort you in time to come as I would have tried to, I, I have no just cause to grieve. What idol has displaced you? A golden one, Ebenezer. You fear the world too much. I have seen your nobler aspirations fall off one by one until the master passion gain engrosses you. Have I not? Well, what then? Even if I have grown so much wiser, what then? I am not changed towards you. Have I ever sought release from our engagement? In words, no, never. In what then? In a changed nature. In an altered spirit. In another atmosphere of life, another hope as its great end. If you were free today, tomorrow, yesterday, can, can even I believe that you would choose a dowerless girl or choosing her? Do I not know that your repentance and regret would surely follow? I do. And therefore I release you with a full heart for the love of him you once were. Spirit, remove me from this place. I told you these were the shadows of things that have been said the ghost, that they are what they are. Do not blame me. Remove me, Scrooge exclaimed. I cannot bear it. Leave me, take me back, and haunt me no longer. As he struggled with the spirit, he was conscious of being exhausted and overcome by an irresistible drowsiness, and further of being in his own bedroom. He had barely time to reel to bed before he sank into a heavy sleep. Dave three, the second of the three spirits. Scrooge awoke in his bedroom. There was no doubt about that. But it and his own adjoining sitting room, into which he shuffled in his slippers, attracted by a great light there, had undergone a surprising transformation. The walls and ceiling were so hung with living green that it looked a perfect grove. The leaves of holly and mistletoe and ivy reflected back the light, as if many little mirrors had been scattered there, and such a mighty blaze went roaring up the chimney, <laughs> as that petrifaction of a hearth had never known in Scrooge's time, or Marley's, or for many and many a winter season gone. Heaped upon the floor to form a kind of throne, were turkeys and geese and game and brawn and great joints of meat, sucking pigs, long wreaths of sausage, mince pies, plum puddings, barrels of oysters, red-hot chestnuts, cherry-cheeked apples, juicy oranges, luscious pears, immense twelfth cakes, and great bowls of punch. In easy state upon this couch, there sat a giant, glorious to see, who bore a glowing torch, in shape not unlike Plenty's horn, and who raised it high to shed its light upon Scrooge as he came peeping round the door. Come in, come in, and know me better, man. <laughs> I am the ghost of Christmas present. Look upon me. You have never seen the likes of me before, eh? No, never. You have never walked forth with the younger members of my family meeting, for I am very young. My elder brother's born in these later years, pursued the phantom. I don't think I have. I'm afraid I have not. Have you had many brothers, spirit? <laughs> More than eighteen <1800. laughs> hundred! A tremendous family to provide for. Spirit, conduct me where you will. I went forth last night on a compulsion, and I, I learnt a lesson which is working even now. Tonight, if you have aught to teach me, let me profit by it. <laughs> well said. Touch my robe. 
Drew did as he was told and held it fast. And the room and its contents all vanished instantly. And they stood in the city streets upon a snowy Christmas morning. Scrooge and Ghost passed on, invisible, straight to Scrooge's clerks. On the threshold of the door, the spirit smiled and stopped to see, stopped to bless Bob Cratchit's dwelling with the sprinkling of his torch. <laughs> Think of that. Bob had but fifteen bob a week himself. He pocketed on Saturdays but fifteen copies of his Christian name. Yet the ghost of Christmas present blessed that four-room house. Then up rose Mrs. Cratchit, Cratchit's wife, dressed out but poorly in a twice-turned gown, brave in ribbons which are cheap and make goodly show for sixpence. And she laid the cloth, the cloth assisted by Belinda Cratchit, second of her daughters, also in brave ribbons. While Master Peter Cratchit plunged a fork into the saucepan of potatoes and getting the corners of his monstrous shirt collar, Bob's private property conferred upon his son and heir in honor of the day, into his mouth he rejoiced to find himself so gallantly attired and yearned to show his linen in the fashionable park. And, and now two smaller Cratchits, boy and girl, came tearing in, screaming that outside the baker's they had smelt the goose and known it for their own, and basking luxurious thoughts of sage and onion, these young Cratchits danced about the table and exalted Master Peter Cratchit to the skies, while he, not proud, although his collars nearly choked him, blew on the fire until the slow potatoes, bubbling up, knocked loudly at the saucepan lid to be let out and peeled. What has ever got your precious father, then? said Mrs. Cratchit, and your brother Tiny Tim, and Martha weren't as late as last Christmas day by half an hour. Here's Martha, mother, said a girl appearing as she spoke. Here's Martha, mother, the two young Cratchits. Hurrah, and there's such a goose, Martha. Why, oh, bless your heart alive, my dear, how late you are, said Mrs. Cratchit, kissing her dozen times and taking off her shawl and bonnet for her. Oh, we had a deal of work to finish up last night, replied the girl, and had to clear away this morning, mother. Well, never mind, so long as you are come, said Mrs. Cratchit. Sit ye down before the fire, my dear, and have a warm, uh, Lord bless ye. No, no, there's father coming, cried the two young Cratchits, who were everywhere at once. Hide, Martha, hide! So Martha hid herself, and in came little Bob, the father, with at least three feet of comforter exclusive of the fringe hanging down before him and his threadbare clothes darned up and brushed to look seasonable, and Tiny Tim upon his shoulder. Uh, alas, for Tiny Tim, he bore a little crutch and had his limbs supported by an iron frame. Where, where's our Martha? cried Bob Cratchit, looking around. Not coming, said Mrs. Cratchit. Not coming, said Bob, with a sudden declension in his high spirits, for he had been Tim's blood horse all the way from church and had come home rampant. Not coming upon Christmas Day? Now Martha did not like to see him disappointed, they were only in joke, and so she came out prematurely from behind the closet door and ran into his arms, while the two young Cratchits hustled Tiny Tim and bore him off to the wash house that he might hear the pudding singing in the copper. And, and how did little Tim behave? asked Mrs. Cratchit, when she had rallied Bob in his credulity, and Bob had hugged his daughter to his heart's content. As good as gold, said Bob, and better. Somehow he gets thoughtful, sitting by himself so much, and... He thinks the strangest things you ever heard. You know, he told me coming home that he hoped the people in church saw him because he was a cripple, and it might be pleasant to them to remember upon Christmas Day who made lame beggars walk and, and blind men to see. Bob's voice was tremulous when he told them this, and trembled more when he said that Tiny Tim was growing strong and hearty. Tiny Tim's active little crutch was heard upon the floor, and Back came Tiny Tim before another word was spoken, escorted by his brother and sister to a stool beside the fire, and while Bob, turning up his cuffs as, as if, poor fellow, they were capable of being made more shabby, compounded some hot mixture in a jug with gin and lemons and stirred it round and round and put it on the hob to simmer. Master Peter and the two ubiquitous young Cratchits went to fetch the goose, with them, which they soon returned in high procession. Mrs. Cratchit made the gravy, ready beforehand, a little saucepan, hissing hot, Master Peter mashed the potatoes with incredible vigor. Miss Belinda sweetened up the applesauce. Martha dusted the hot place. Bob took Tiny Tim beside him in a tiny corner of the table. The two young Cratchits set chairs for everybody, not forgetting themselves, and mounting guard upon their posts, crammed spoons into their mouths lest they should shriek for goose before their turn came to be helped. At last the dishes were set on. Grace was said. It was succeeded by a breathless pause as Mrs. Cratchit, looking slowly along the carving knife, prepared to plunge it in the breast. But when she did, and when the long 
unexpected gush of stuffing issued forth. One murmur of delight rose all around the board. And even tiny Tim, excited by the two young cratchits, beat on the table with the handle of his knife and feebly cried out, Hurrah! Oh, there never was such a goose. Bob said he didn't believe there was ever such a goose cooked. Its tenderness and flavor and size and cheapness were the themes of universal admiration. Eked out by applesauce and mashed potatoes, it was a sufficient dinner for the whole family. Indeed, as Mrs. Cratchit said with great delight, surveying one tiny small atom of a bone upon the dish, they had not eaten it all at last. Yet everyone had had enough, and the young Cratchits in particular were steeped in sage and onion to the eyebrows. But now the plates being changed by Miss Belinda, Mrs. Cratchit left the room alone, too nervous to bear witness, to take the pudding up and bring it in. Suppose it should not be done enough. Suppose it should break in turning out. Suppose somebody should have got over the wall of the backyard and stolen it while they were married with the goose. Oh, a supposition at which the young Cratchits became livid. All sorts of horrors were supposed about that pudding. Hello! A great deal of steam. The pudding was out of the copper. A smell like washing day. That was the cloth. A smell like an eating house and a pastry cook's next door to each other with a laundress's next door to that. Oh, that was that pudding. In a half minute, Mrs. Cratchit entered, flushed but smiling proudly, with the pudding like a speckled cannonball, so hard and firm, blessing in half a half a quarter of ignited brandy, and the dight with Christmas holly stuck into the top. Oh, a wonderful pudding, Bob Cratchit said, and calmly, too, that he regarded it as the greatest success achieved by Mrs. Cratchit since their marriage. Mrs. Cratchit said that now the weight was off her mind, she would confess that she, while she had had her doubts about the great quantity of flour and Everybody had something to say about it, but nobody said or thought it was all a small pudding for a large family. Any Cratchit would have blushed to hint at such a thing as that. At last the dinner was all done, the cloth was clear, the hearth was swept, the fire made up, the compound and the jug being tasted considered perfect. Apples and oranges were put up on the table and a shovel full of chestnuts on the fire. Then all the Cratchit family drew round the hearth and in what Bob Cratchit called a circle and at Bob Cratchit's elbow stood the family display of glass. Two tumblers and a custard cup without a handle. These he held the hot stuff from the jug. However, as well as golden goblets would have done, and Bob served it out with a beaming look while the chestnuts in the fire sputtered and crackled noisily. And then Bob proposed, Merry Christmas to all us all, my dears. God bless us. Which all the family re-echoed. God bless us, everyone, said Tiny Tim last of all. He sat very close to his father's side upon his little stool, and Bob held his withered little hand in his, as if he loved that child and wished to keep him by his side and dreaded that he might be taken from him. Scrooge raised his head speedily upon hearing his own name. Mr. Scrooge, said Bob. I'll give you Mr. Scrooge, the founder of the feast. Oh, the founder of the feast, indeed, cried Mrs. Cratchit, reddening. I wish I had him here. I'd give him a piece of mind to feast upon. I'd hope he'd have a good appetite for it. My dear, said Bob, the children, Christmas Day. It should be Christmas Day, I'm sure, said she, on which one drinks the health of such an odious, stingy, hard, unfeeling man as Mr. Scrooge. You know he is, Robert. Nobody knows it better than you do, my poor fellow. My dear, was Bob's mild answer, Christmas Day. Oh, I'll drink his health for your sake and for the days said Mrs. Cratchit. Not for his. <laughs> Long life to him. A Merry Christmas. A Happy New Year. He'll be very merry, very happy, I have no doubt. The children drank the toast after her. It was the first of their proceedings which had no heartiness in it. Tiny Tim drank it last of all, but he didn't care twopence for it. Scrooge was the, <laughs> the ogre of that family. The mention of his name cast a dark shadow on the party which was not dispelled for a full five minutes. But after it had passed, and they were ten times merrier than before, from the merry leaf of Scrooge the Baleful being done with, Bob Cratchit told them how he had a situation in his eye for Master Peter, which would bring in, if obtained, full five and sixpence weekly. The two young Cratchits laughed tremendously at the idea of Peter's being a man of business, and Peter himself looked thoughtfully at the fire from between his collars, as though so he were deliberating what particular investments he should favor when he came into the receipt of that bewildering income. Martha, who was a poor apprentice at Milliner's, then told them what kind of work she had to do and how many hours she had worked at a stretch and how she meant to lie abed tomorrow for a good long rest. Tomorrow being a holiday, she passed at home. 
Also how she had seen a countess and a lord some days before, and how the lord was much about as tall as Peter, in which Peter pulled up his collar so high you could have seen his, couldn't have seen his head if he'd been there. And all this time the chestnuts and the jug went round and round, and by and by they had a, I had a song about a lost child travelling in the snow from Tiny Tim, with a plaintive little voice, and sang it very well indeed. Now, there was nothing of high mark in all this. They were not a handsome family. They were not well-dressed. Their shoes were far from being waterproof. Their clothes were scanty. And Peter might have known, and very likely did, the inside of a pawnbroker's. Ah. Uh, but they were happy, grateful, pleased with one another, contented with the time. And when they faded and looked happier yet in the bright sprinklings of the spirit's torch at parting, Scrooge had his eye upon them, and especially on Tiny Tim, until the last. And it was a great surprise to Scrooge as this seed vanished. To hear a hearty laugh. It was a much greater surprise to Scrooge to recognize it as his own nephew's and to find himself in a bright, dry, gleaming room, which the spirit standing smiling by his side and looking at the same nephew. It is a fair, even-handed, noble adjustment of things that while there is infection and disease and in sorrow, there is nothing in the world so irresistibly contagious as laughter and good humor. When Scrooge's nephew laughed, Scrooge's niece by marriage laughed as heartily as he, and as some their assembled friends, being not a bit behindhand, laughed out lustily. He said, <laughs> he said that Christmas was a humbug as I lived, cried Scrooge's nephew. He believed it too. Oh, more shame for him, Fred, said Scrooge's niece indignantly. Oh, bless those women. They never do anything by halves. They're always in earnest. She was very pretty exceedingly pretty, with a dimpled, surprised-looking capital face, a ripe little mouth that seemed made to be kissed, as no doubt it was, all kinds of good little dots about her chin that melted into one another when she laughed in the sunniest pair of eyes you ever saw in any little creature's head. Altogether, she was what you would have called provoking. Oh, but satisfactory, too. Oh, perfectly satisfactory. <laughs> He's a comical old fellow, said Scrooge's nephew. That's the truth, and not so pleasant as he might be. However, his offenses carry their own judgment and punishment. I have nothing to say against him. Who suffers by his ill whims? Him. Himself always. Here he takes it into his head to dislike us, and he won't come and dine with us. So what's the consequence? <laughs> he don't lose much of a dinner. Oh, indeed, I think he loses a very good dinner, interrupted Scrooge's niece. Everybody else said the same. They must be allowed to have been competent judges because they had just had that dinner, and with a dessert upon the table, they were clustered round the fire by lamplight. Well, I'm very glad to hear it, said Scrooge's nephew, because I haven't any great faith in these young housekeepers. <laughs> what do you say, Topper? Now, Topper <clears throat> clearly had his eye on one of Scrooge's niece's sisters, for he answered that Batcher was a wretched outcast. He had no right to express an opinion on the subject, whereas Scrooge's niece's sister, the plump one with the lace tucker, not the one with the roses, blushed. After tea, they had some music. For they were a musical family, and they knew what they were about when they sung a glee or a catch, I can assure you. Especially Topper, who could growl away in bass like a good one and never swell the large veins in his forehead and get red in the face over it. <clears throat> but they didn't devote the whole evening to music, no. After a while, they played at forfeits, for it is good to be a children sometimes, and never better than at Christmas, when its mighty founder was a child himself. And it was... First a game at blind man's buff, though, and I no more believe Topper was really blinded than when I believe he had eyes in his boots, because the way in which he went after that plump sister in the lace tucker was an outrage of the credulity of the human nature, <laughs> knocking down the fire irons, tumbling over chairs, bumping up against the piano, smothering himself among the curtains. And it's wherever she went, there went he. He always knew where the plump sister was, somehow. Oh, he would not catch anyone else. If you had fallen up against him, as some of them did, and stood there, he would have made a feint of endeavouring to seize you, which would have been a reply to an affront to your understanding, and would instantly have sidled off in the direction of the plump sister. Uh, here's a new game, said Scrooge. One half-hour spirit, only one. The new game was called Yes and No, where Scrooge's nephew had to think of something, and the rest must find out what. He only answering to their questions, yes or no, as the case was. The fire of questioning to which he was exposed elicited from him that he was thinking of an animal, a live animal, a rather disagreeable animal, 
a savage animal, an animal that growled and grunted sometimes and talked sometimes and lived in London, walked about the streets, was not made a show of, wasn't led by anyone and didn't live in a menagerie and was never killed in a market, was not a horse or an ass or a cow or a bull or a tiger or a dog or a pig or a cat or a bear. At every new question put to him, this nephew burst out into a fresh roar of laughter and was so inexpressibly tickled that he was obliged to get up off the sofa and stamp. At last, the plump sister cried out, Oh, I found it out! <laughs> I know what it is, Fred! I know what it is! What is it? cried Fred. It's your Uncle Scrooge! Which it certainly was. Admiration was the sentiment, though some objected that the reply to, Is it a bear? ought to have been, yes. Uncle Scrooge had imperceptibly come so gay and light of heart that he would have drank to the unconscious company in inaudible speech. But the whole scene passed off in the breath of the last word spoken by his nephew, and he and the spirit were again upon their travels. Much they saw, and far they went that night. Many homes they visited, but always with a happy end. The spirit stood beside sick beds, and they were cheerful on foreign lands, and they were close at home, by struggling men, and they were patient in their great hope, by poverty, and it was rich, in almshouse, hospital, and jail, a misery's own, and every refuge, where a vain man in his little brief authority had not made fast the door and barred the spirit out, he left his blessing and taught Scrooge his precepts. Suddenly, as they stood together in an open place, the bell struck twelve. Scrooge looked about at him for the ghost and saw it no more. As the last stroke ceased to vibrate, he remembered the prediction of old Jacob Marley, and lifting up his eyes, beheld a solemn phantom, draped and hooded, coming like a mist along the ground towards him. This is day four, the last of the spirits. The phantom slowly, gravely, silently approached. When it came near him, Scrooge bent down upon his knee, for in the air through which this spirit moved it seemed to scatter gloom and mystery. It was shrouded in a deep black garment which concealed its head, its face, its form, and left nothing of it visible save one outstretched hand. He knew no more, for this spirit neither spoke nor moved. I... I am, I am in the presence of the ghost of Christmas yet to come. Ghost of the future, I fear you more than any specter I have seen. But as I know your purpose is to do me good, and as I hope to live to be another man from what I was, I, I am prepared to bear you company and do it with a thankful heart. Will you not speak to me? He gave him no reply. The hand was pointed straight before them. <sighs> Lead on. Lead on, spirit. The night is waning fast, and it is precious time to me, I know. Lead on, spirit. <clears throat> they scarcely seemed to enter the city, for the city rather seemed to spring up about them. But there they were in the heart of it, unchanged amongst the merchants. The spirit stopped beside one little knot of businessmen, observing that the hand was pointed to them, of Scrooge advanced to listen to their talk. No, said a great fat man with a monstrous chin. I don't know much about it either way. I only know he's dead. Well, when did he die? inquired another. Last night, I believe. Why? What was the matter with him? <laughs> I thought he'd never die. Oh, God knows. <clears throat> well, what has he done with his money, then? asked a red-faced gentleman. Then I haven't heard, said the man with a large chin. Company, perhaps. He hasn't left it to me. That's all I know. Bye-bye. Hmm. Scrooge was at first inclined to be surprised that the spirit should attach importance to a conversation apparently so trivial. But feeling assured that it must have some hidden purpose, he set himself to consider what it was likely to be. It could scarcely be supposed to have any bearing on the death of Jacob Marley, his old partner, for that was past, and this ghost's province was the future. He looked about in that very place for his own image. But another man stood in his accustomed corner, and though the clock pointed to his usual time of day for being there, he saw no likenesses of himself among the multitudes that poured in through the porch. It gave him little surprise, however, for he had been revolving in his mind just recently a change of life, and he thought and hoped and he saw his newborn resolutions carried out in this.
They left this busy scene and went into an obscure part of town, to a low shop where iron, old rags, bottles, bones, and greasy offal were bought. A gray-haired rascal of great age sat smoking his pipe. Scrooge and the Phantom came into the presence of this man, just as a woman with a heavy bundle slunk into the shop. But she had scarcely entered when another woman similarly laden came in, too, and she was closely followed by a man in faded black. After a short period of blank astonishment, in which the old man with a pipe had joined them, they all three burst into a laugh. <laughs> <laughs> Let the charwoman be the first cried she who had entered first. Let the laundress be the second, and let the undertaker's man be the third. <laughs> Look here, old Joe, here's a chance if we haven't all three met here without meaning it. <laughs> hey, you couldn't have met in a better place. You were made free of it long ago, you know. And the other two ain't no strangers, neither. What have you got to sell to me? What have you got to sell? <laughs> Half a minute's patience, Joe, and you shall see. <laughs> what odds, Ned, what odds? Every person has a right to take care of themselves. Ah, oh, he always did. Heh. And who's the worst for loss of a few things like these? Not a dead man, I suppose. <laughs> no, indeed, ma'am. No, indeed. If he wanted to keep him after he was dead, the wicked old screw, why wasn't he natural in his lifetime? If he had been, he might have somebody to look after him when he was struck with death instead of lying gasping out his last there alone by himself. <laughs> The truest word that's ever spoke is a judgment upon him. Her! A judgment? I wish it was a little heavier judgment, and it should have been. You may depend upon it if I could have laid my hands on anything else. Open that old bundle, old Joe, and let me know what you... <laughs> let me know the value of it. Meh! Speak out plain. I'm not afraid to be the first, nor afraid for them to see it. Joe went down on his knees for the great convenience of opening the bundle and dragged out a large and heavy roll of some dark stuff. What? <laughs> What do you call this? Bed curtains? Ah, <laughs> yeah, bed curtains. <laughs> Don't drop that oil upon the blankets now. His blankets? Who else should do you think? He isn't likely to take cold without them, I dare say. <laughs> you may look through that shirt till your eyes ache, but you won't find a hole in it nor a threadbare place. <laughs> it's the best he had, and a fine one too. I may have wasted it by dressing him up in it <laughs> if it hadn't been for me. Scrooge listened to this dialogue in horror. Yes, spirit, I, I see, I, I see. The case of this unhappy man might be my own. My, my life tends that way. Now, uh, ah, merciful heavens, uh, what is this? The scene had changed, and now he has almost touched a bare and curtain bed. A pale light rising in the outer air fell straight upon this bed, knit, unwatched, unwept, uncared for, was the body of this plundered, unknown man. Spirit. Let me see some tenderness connected with the death, or well, this dark chamber spirit will be forever present to me. The ghost conducted him to poor Bob Cratchit's house, the dwelling he had visited before, and found the mother and the children seated around the fire. Quiet now. Very quiet. The noisy little Cratchits were as still as statues in one corner and sat looking up at Peter who had a book before him. The mother and her daughters were engaged in needlework. But surely they were very quiet. And he took a child and set him in the midst of them. Where had Scrooge heard the, those words? He had not dreamed them. The boy must have read them out. And he took a child and set them in the midst of them. And as he and the spear crossed the threshold, why did he not go on? The mother laid her work upon the table and put her hand to her face. <laughs> Color hurts my eyes, she said. Uh, the color, uh, poor tiny Tim. <sighs> it matter now yet. It makes them weak by candlelight, and I wouldn't show weak eyes to your father when he comes home for the world. It must be near his time. Past it, rather, Peter answered, shutting up his book. But I think he has walked a little slower than he used these last few evenings, mother. Uh, I have known him walk with... <laughs> I have known him walk with Tiny Tim upon his shoulder very fast indeed. So have I, cried Peter, often. And so have I, exclaimed another. So had all. But he was very light to carry, and his father loved him so, so that it was no trouble. No trouble. And there is your father at the door. She hurried out to meet him, and little Bob and his comforter, he had need of it, poor fellow, came in. His tea was ready for him on the hob. 
and they all tried who should help him to it most. Then the two young Cratchits got upon his knee and laid each child a little cheek against his face as if they said, Don't mind it, Father, don't be grieved. Bob was very cheerful with them and spoke pleasantly to all the family. He looked at the work upon the table, praised the industry and the speed of Mrs. Cratchit and the girls. It would be done long before Sunday, he said. Sunday? You went today, then, Robert? Yes, my dear, returned Bob. I wish you could have been there. It would have done you good to see how green a place it is. But, well, you'll see it often. I, I promised him that I would walk there on a Sunday. My little, little child. My little child. He broke down all at once. He couldn't help it. If he could have helped it, he and his child would have been farther apart, perhaps, if they were. Spectre, said Scrooge, something informs me that our parting moment is at hand. I know it, but I know not how. Tell me what man that was with a covered face whom we saw lying dead. The ghost of Christmas yet to come conveyed him to a dismal, wretched, ruinous churchyard. The spirit stood among the graves and pointed down to one. Before I draw nearer to that stone to which you point, answer me one question. Are these the shadows of things that will be, or are they the shadows of things that may be only? Still the ghost pointed downward to the grave by which it stood. <laughs> Men's courses will foreshadow certain ends to which if pers persevered that they must lead, but if the courses be departed from, that the ends will change. Say it is thus with what you show me. The spirit was as immovable as ever. Scrooge kept towards it, trembling as he went, and following the finger read upon the stone of the neglected grave his own name. Ebenezer Scrooge. Oh, am I that man who lay upon the bed? No, spirit, oh no, no, spirit, hear me. I am not the man I was. I will not be the man I must have been but for this intercourse. Why show me this if I am past all hope? Assure me that I may yet change these shadows you have shown me by an altered life. For the first time the kind hand faltered. I will honor Christmas in my heart and try to keep it all the year. I will live in the past, the present, and the future. The spirit of all three shall strive within me. I will not shut out the lessons that they teach. Oh, tell me I may sponge away the writing on this stone. holding up his hands in one last prayer to have his fate reversed. He saw an alteration in the phantom hood and dress. It shrunk, collapsed, and dwindled down into a bedpost. Yes, and the bedpost was his own. The bed was his own, the room was his own, and best and happiest of all the time before him was his own to make amends in. He was checked in his transports by the churches, ringing out the lustiest peals he had ever heard. Running to the window, he opened it and put out his head. No fog, no mist, no night. Clear, bright, stirring, golden day. What's today? cried Scrooge, calling downward to a boy in Sunday clothes who perhaps had loitered in to look about him. Hey! What's today, my fine fellow? Today? Why, it's Christmas Day! It's Christmas Day. I haven't missed it. Hello, my fine fellow. Hello! Do you know the poulterers in the next street but one, at the corner? Uh, I should hope I did. An intelligent boy, a remarkable boy. Do you know whether they've sold the prize turkey that was hanging up there? Not the little prize turkey, the big one. What? The one as big as me? Oh, what a delightful boy. It's a pleasure to talk to him. Yes, my buck. It's hanging there now. Is it? Go and buy it. Walker! exclaimed the boy. No, no, I am earnest. Go and buy it. Tell them to bring it here that I may give them direction where to take it. Come back with a man, I'll give you a shilling. Come back when less than five minutes, I'll give you half a crown. <laughs> the boy was off like a shot. I'll send it to Bob Cratchit's. He shan't know who sends it. It's twice the size of Tiny Tim. Joe Miller never made such a joke as sending it to Bob's will be. The hand in which he wrote the address was not a steady one, but rightly he did, and somehow went downstairs to open the street door, ready for the coming of the poulterer's man. And it was a turkey. He never could have stood upon his legs, that bird. He would have snapped them off short in a minute like sticks of sealing wax. 
Scrooge dressed himself all in his best and at last got out in the streets. The people were by this time pouring forth as he had seen them with the ghost of Christmas present, and walking with his hands behind him, Scrooge regarded every one with a delighted smile. He looked so irresistibly pleasant in a word that three or four good-humored fellows said, Good morning, sir. A Merry Christmas to you. And Scrooge said often afterwards that of all the blithe sounds he had ever heard, these were the blithest in his ears. In the afternoon he turned his steps towards his nephew's house. Oh, he passed the door a dozen times. He had took not the courage to go up and knock. But he made a dash, and he did it. Jim, master, at home, my dear, said Scrooge to the girl. Nice girl, very. Yes, sir. Where is he, my love? He's in the dining room, sir, with his mistress. Oh, he knows me, said Scrooge, with his hand already on the dining room lock. I'll go in here, and, uh, my dear. <clears throat> Fred! <laughs> Bless my soul! cried Fred. Who's that? It is I, your Uncle Scrooge. I've come to dinner. Will you let me in, Fred? <laughs> let him in? It is a mercy he didn't shake his arm off. He was home in five minutes. Nothing could be hardier. His niece looked just the same. So did Topper when he came. So did the plump sister when she came. So did everyone when they came. Wonderful party, wonderful games, wonderful unanimity, wonderful happiness. Uh. But Scrooge was early at the office the next morning. Oh, he was early there. If he could only be there first and catch Bob Cratchit coming late, that was the thing he had set his heart upon. <clears throat> and he did it. The clock struck nine. No Bob. A quarter past. No Bob. Bob was a full eighteen minutes and a half behind his time. Scrooge sat with his door wide open that he might see him come into the tank. Bob's hat was off before he opened the door. His comforter, too, he was on his stool in the jiffy, driving away with his pen as if he were trying to overtake nine o'clock. Hello, growled Scrooge, in his accustomed voice, as near as he could feign it. What do you mean by coming here this time of day? Uh, I'm very sorry, sir. I, I, I am behind my time. You are? Yes. Yes, I think you are. Step this way, if you please, Mr. Cratchit. It's only once a year, sir. It shall not be repeated. I was making making rather merry yesterday, sir. And I'll tell you what, my friend. I am not going to stand this sort of thing any longer. And therefore... <laughs> Scrooge continued to leaping from his stool and giving Bob such a dig in the waistcoat that he staggered back into the tank again. Therefore, I am about to raise your salary. Ha <laughs> ha! Bob trembled and got a little nearer to the ruler. Merry Christmas, Bob, said Scrooge with an earnestness that could not be mistaken as he clapped him on the back. A merrier Christmas, Bob, my good fellow, than I have given you for many a year. I will raise your salary and endeavor to assist your struggling family. We will discuss your affairs this very afternoon over a Christmas bowl of smoking Bishop Bob Cratchit. Make up the fires, buy a second coal shuttle before you dot another eye, Bob Cratchit. Scrooge was better than his word. He did it all and infinitely more. And to tiny Tim, who did not die, he was a second father. He became as good a friend, as good a master, and as good a man as the old city knew, or any other good old city knew, or any town or borough in the good old world. Some people laughed to see the alteration in him, but his own heart laughed, and that was quite enough for him. Oh, Scrooge had no further discourse of spirits. Scrooge had no further discourse of spirits, but lived in that respect upon the total abstinence principle ever afterwards. And was always said of him that he knew Christmas well if alive as a may that truly all of us. And so his tiny Tim lived. God bless us, everyone.
Thank you, everyone. What a fabulous turnout. Shari, Kim, Mike, wonderful, just wonderful. What a great, great beginning to Christmas season. It's so exciting to see all you people here. I tell you where to go and visit more in Coopersville because it's an amazing 8x8, 64 regions of awesomeness. But I don't know my way around here. Um, see, I'm kind of new in this world. But Kim and Kashari and Mike do. So if you have time, you want to scoot around Coopersville this evening and carry on. Neat stuff to see. Just exactly the century I like. Thank you everybody for being here. I was just so excited that so many of you showed up. Um, you're free to go stand by Mr. Dickens if you'd like to have your photo taken with him. Um, and you can mingle with others. I'm just so happy that you all came. Hey Bruce, can you hear me? Thank you, Ruby, for greeting the guests. 